Lesson 11, the flight environment. This one's kind of long. It's got a lot of detail in it. We're going to start learning more and more about airports and airspace, and we should really understand kind of the flight environment as a whole before we really dive into the, the details of airports, airspace, things like that. So let's start with the flight environment here. Make sure you have your packets ready. Make sure you get those notes filled out. So here we go. Um, you should be able to understand important safety considerations after this, gain a basic understanding of the airport, including runway layout, traffic patterns, visual aids, lighting safety considerations, be able to interpret aeronautical charts. We already talked about that in an earlier lesson, a little bit about sectional charts, and gain an understanding of how to operate within the NOS, the National Airspace System, in accordance with uh, FAR Part 91. So let's start off with phases of flight. So phases of flight, um, there's kind of they've broken them into different parts of flight. And let's talk about the first thing is engine startup. That's when you're literally starting the engine and you're getting ready to take off. And um, that's the very beginning phase of flight. And then afterwards we'll go to taxiing. That's taxiing around, moving around on the ground on the airport surface, um, things like that. Um, we also have um, then we have takeoff, the takeoff phase. Okay. We have climbing phase, cruise phase, descent, landing, and then shutdown. And they're all kind of can be broken into different phases of flight. So take a second and make sure you have all of those written down. All righty. So you should just understand that by phase of flight, there's a lot of different statistics. Like, number one, look at which one is the most dangerous phase of flight. Well, I should say dangerous in terms of the most accidents. The most accidents is during the landing phase of flight. We're operating near the ground. Maybe we're trying to put the plane on the ground in conditions that aren't very favorable um, for that aircraft. And um, so there's a lot of reasons why that could be. And look at this. Go rounds are very low, descent is very low, climbing is very low, but takeoff and landing, the two most dangerous phases of flight. Um, also here, we'll talk about this in class, but this is a little bit about you know, different make and models of airplanes, type of flight, air carriers, agricultural, um, and then you would have this large section here, which is general aviation, that's us who learn to be private pilots. So we'll talk about that in class a little bit more, and we'll also talk about um, kind of like what causes these accidents, like the loss of an engine, loss of control on the ground, loss of control in flight, things like that. So if we want to avoid accidents, one thing we should try to do is to avoid collisions with other aircraft. We should try to avoid collisions with other aircraft in the area. And so let's take a look at some of these precautions. Um, first thing you should know is vision is the most important sense for the safety of flight more important than hearing or feel or any of those and things that impact vision are haze night time low lighting clouds things like that so you should um, be able to scan the horizon and uh, and things like that for uh, um, other aircraft, things like that. But if you have clouds, it's nighttime, haze, it can be hard to see those things. So scanning the sky for other aircraft is the key factor in collision avoidance. Because the eyes only focus on a narrow viewing area, a scan of about 10 degrees of head movement is recommended. So what that means is, um, well, sorry, I'm trying to find the right button here. So when you're scanning, you don't want to like look around like this really quickly. You want to just move your head in small 10 degree increments and kind of look up and down really slowly while you're looking for aircraft. That's what you want to do with that. Uh, in preparation for night flight, we're talking about night flight, pilots should avoid bright white light or white light for 30 minutes before takeoff. We'll watch a video on that. And then let's talk a little bit about visual scanning. One time you should always scan this before any maneuver. A pilot should visually scan the entire area. You should use shallow banks of about 20 degrees and look up, down, left, and right. Any aircraft that appears to not be moving is likely direct, heading directly at you. So if you look up and you see an aircraft and it's just kind of holding still, it's probably coming straight at you or it's coming straight away fr from you, okay? So... Keep that in mind, too, that if it looks like a dot in the sky, it's probably heading at you or you're heading straight at it, one of the two. 
Uh, there are right-of-way rules when it comes to aircraft. Things you should know about right-of-way, number one, typically the slower, lower aircraft has the right-of-way. The less maneuverable an aircraft is, the more likely it has the right-of-way. When two aircraft um, are approaching head-on, both should deviate to the right. Both should deviate to the right. Like this. An aircraft being overtaken has the right of way. So if you're overtaking another aircraft, okay, so you're overtaking them, they have the right of way. The slower aircraft has the right of way. And if two are approaching at 90 degrees, then the one to the right has the right of way and others should pass behind it. I'll talk about that a little bit more in class, but something like this. So this one is to the left of this one. There's nothing to the right of it, so this one has the right of way. So this aircraft should pass behind it. So let's talk a little bit about wake turbulence. We'll watch that video in class. But two times when the aircraft's most vulnerable is during takeoff and landing. We talked about those accident results earlier. Having an unexpected experience during those phases of flight can be really scary and very dangerous. So when an aircraft is flying, we learned about wingtip vortices and a little bit about induced drag in, uh, in our aerodynamics lesson. But wingtip vortices by the aircraft, they slowly descend behind the airplane, okay? And the bigger the airplane is, the more vortices these things can produce. And when the aircraft touches down, the wing produces less lift, quits flying, the vortices end, the vortices end. The aircraft that produces the strongest vortices are heavy, clean, and slow, meaning heavy aircraft, like large aircraft, clean meaning not as much flap, so they're having to pitch up more and produce more lift that big old wing and they're going real slow real slow so how do you avoid wake turbulence while well, landing you should stay at or above the larger aircraft's final approach path and note the touchdown point and then land past it so in this case this aircraft should note where this aircraft touches down and fly past that and land past it once this aircraft's off the runway of course now if you're taking off you should rotate or take off prior to the point at which the preceding aircraft rotated and then maneuver your aircraft to avoid the flight of the preceding craft. So he's going to rotate before this jet rotated. This plane should take less runway anyway and climb up above it. And then maybe sidestep it if it needs to. Now we do have minimum safe altitudes. Anywhere you are, the pilot must maintain an altitude which in the event of an engine failure will allow for an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the ground. Over congested areas, 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle and 2,000 feet above you. And other than congested areas, 500 feet above the surface and 500 feet from any structure or vessel. We will go over that in class. So just kind of write those down in your notes, and I'll explain a little bit more about how that works in class. All right, let's talk about airports. We're finally getting to talk about something other than airplanes and people flying airplanes, pilots. We're going to talk about airports. Airports, there are two types. There are controlled and uncontrolled airports, not and, and. They're controlled and and uncontrolled airports. All right, number two, um, controlled airports have a control tower at them. Number three, uncontrolled airports require pilots to maintain safety throughout those procedures. Sorry, through procedures. What I mean by that is following standard pattern entries, following standard altitudes in the pattern, and just, cer just certain procedures you need to follow at uncontrolled airports. That way you're predictable and people know what you're going to do. All right, let's talk a little bit about runways and taxiways. Uh, first of all, runways are used for aircraft to take off and land. Taxiways are used for movement of aircraft on the ground. Runways are named with numbers and taxiways are named with letters. All right, let's talk about some airport markings. Runway numbers, based on the magnetic heading of the runway when you take off from position. So look at this runway here. See that two and that seven? That means that if you added a zero to that, that would be 270. So that runway is facing um, west, west. So you can see on the east side of the field, this would be 27 because when an airplane 
is taking off and flying. Let's see if I can do this the right way. When it's taking off and flying that way, it's facing west. So therefore, it takes off and it's flying west. Therefore, the number is 270. Even though it's on the east side of the field, it's facing west for the airplanes taking off and landing on 27. Now, the same piece of asphalt on the other end has a 9 on it. Well, that's because people going that other direction um, that are flying the other way, they're flying east and they're landing and taking off at a heading roughly of zero nine or zero or east. So these lots of different kinds of markings, but essentially they're all the same. You add a zero to the end of it, and that should give you roughly the heading of that aircraft, the magnetic heading of that runway, I should say. But what if there's more than one runway facing the same direction? And what if you have two runways that have a heading of one nine or zero, which would make it runway nineteen? Well, you just add a letter to it, like three six left, three six center, and three six right. You can get lots of different runways for that. Well, how do you choose which runway to use? Well, first of all, you should always take off and land into the wind. We get the most relative relevant wind, relative wind, when we're taking off and landing in the wind. Therefore, our ground speed can be slower, but our relevant or relative wind can be higher. Therefore, we can produce more lift um, than we can with a tailwind, and we can also have a nice slow ground speed when landing, if we're landing into a headwind. And so we, to do that, we use some wind direction indicators. So some of those wind direction indicators are things like um, wind socks, tetrahedrons, wind tees. So here's a picture of a tetrahedron. There's a wind tee, and there's a wind sock, and we'll talk more about those in class. Next, we have traffic patterns. This is just something you're going to have to memorize. Um, so the, when we depart, that's called the upwind leg. Then if we turn left, we call that crosswind leg. Now, you should also know that sometimes pilots say the direction of their turn before the name of the leg. For example, crosswind leg would be referred to as left crosswind because we're turning left in the pattern. We're turning left in the pattern. Therefore, we're making a left pattern. There are right patterns at airports. There's left patterns at airports. The standard pattern is a left pattern, but airports can have right patterns. Uh, you can find those on sectional charts and in um, in chart supplements, airports that have right patterns. Maybe there's a hospital nearby or something like that. But uh, just know that I may say left crosswind or right crosswind. I'm talking about the direction of the turn and the pattern. But look here. Look, they're making left turns all the way through this whole pattern. So this is a left crosswind or crosswind leg. And then this is called downwind leg. This is a left downwind. And then we're going to turn this, and that's going to be a left base or a base leg. And then the last one where we come into land, that's just called final approach. You don't say left or right on final approach. You just say, I'm on final approach for runway 9 or final approach for runway 20 or 20, I should say. The proper way to enter a traffic pattern is 45 degrees to the downwind leg, and we'll talk more about that in class. But essentially, you get to see all of the pattern if you enter it from that way. I like to be on a 45 to the downwind, two miles from the traffic pattern, at traffic pattern altitude, scanning for traffic, and I like to enter on the downwind, then fly the downwind around to base, to final, then come in to land. Um, when the aircraft enter traffic pattern without a tower, the pilot usually fly left-hand turns. When there is no tower, all pilots should monitor CTAF, which is called the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. Sometimes you'll get these little markers here. This is basically saying if you're flying to this runway, so let's say that this is facing east, so this would be runway 9, you're going to make left-hand turns to runway 9. If you're flying off into this runway, which would be runway 27, you're going to make right-hand turns into 27. So it's a right-hand pattern to 27 and a left-hand pattern to 9 and we're going to talk more about how to decode this stuff in class. More information on that stuff, you can always look it up in the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual. We learned about that way back at the beginning of class. They have all kinds of information about signs and markings in there. All right, let's talk a little bit about airport markings. So use the figure in 64 um, in your packet. Follow along. We'll do this in class together. So... 
Don't fill this out just yet. We'll do this in class together. Let's talk a little bit about airport lighting. What if you're flying in there at night? Well, the first thing is a rotating beacon. Okay, a rotating beacon. You'll see these at almost all airports. And white and green, so like the one here in the picture on the screen, that's a lighted land airport. It's not a seaport. It's not a heliport. White and yellow, that's a lighted water port airport. So don't land on that with your airplane. You'll land in the water in the dark. Green, yellow, white, that's a heliport. A military identified with two quick flashes between green. So you'll have green, and then you'll have white, white. And then it'll go green, white, white, military airfields. When an airport beacon's on during the daytime, it means that the ceiling is less than 1,000 feet and or the visibility is less than three statute miles. Runway edge lights are white. Taxiway lights are blue. At some airports, you can use seven, th five, or three clicks on your radio, and it'll turn off the lights or turn, adjust the intensity to the lights. Okay, so you can literally go on your radio and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the lights will come on at night. It's kind of fun to do when you're flying around at night to see that. They want you to know about this thing called a VASI. This is a visual um, approach slope indicator. One special lighting system is the VASI. It consists of two bars, um, a white bar and a red bar if you're on glide slope. Two red means you're too low. Two white means fly all night, you're too high. You're looking for that two white and two red. Now, you may also have a PAPI, which is very similar to a VASI, and that's four lights in a row. Our simulators seem to have PAPIs at airports. So four whites, you're too high. One red, three whites, slightly high. Two red, two white, you're on glide path. Three red, you're low. Four red, you're really low. All night, fly all night. All red and you're dead. That's how I remember that. All right, let's talk about taxing a little bit. In general, taxing in calm winds presents really no problem. You're just make sure you're paying attention. You don't run into stuff. You use your feet to steer with the rudders. However, when you're in high winds, you have to adjust those control surfaces. So if the wind, these arrows represent wind. So if the wind's coming from like the upper left, you're going to go aileron up, left wing, and neutral elevator, meaning you're going to go, you're going to turn to the left. I know that looked like probably to your right on the screen, so turn to your left but you're gonna go left aileron up and you're not gonna push in or out. When you have a quartering headwind, that's what they call this when it's coming from the right. It's a headwind, but it's from the kind of quadrant over here, quartering headwind. You can use right up uh, aileron and neutral elevator. That back here, down aileron and left wing and down elevator. So we say dive away. So if the wind's coming from the back side, one of the back corners, you turn away from the wind. So if the wind's coming from that way, you're going to turn away from the wind. Um, we'll talk more about that in class. Just remember to dive away when you're taxing in tailwinds. We're going to review chart supplements in class, and we're going to look at a couple different airports while we do it. Okay? So All righty. So hopefully you got those notes filled out. It's really important to get this stuff before you come to class so it's not the first time you've heard it when I'm talking to you about it in class so we can really get, get into some depth on this. Thanks.